the Penitence Retreat. Nicholas and Sherborne returned by a different road from that taken by the others, and loitered so much by the way that they did not arrive at the manor house until the prisoner and his escort had set out. Probably this was designed as Nicholas seemed relieved when he learned they were gone. Having entered the house with his brother-in-law and conducted him to an apartment opening out of the hall, usually occupied by Mistress Asherton, and where in fact they found that amiable lady employed at her embroidery, he left Sherborne with her, and making some excuse for his own hasty retreat, he took himself to another part of the house. Mounting the principal staircase, which was of dark oak with richly carved railing, he turned into a gallery communicating with the sleeping apartments, and after proceeding more than halfway down it, halted before a door, which he unlocked and entered a spacious but evidently disused chamber, hung round with faded tapestry, and containing a large gloomy looking bedstead, securing the door carefully after him. Nicholas raised the hangings in one corner of the room, and pressing against a spring, a sliding panel flew open. A screen was placed within, so as to hide from view the inmates of the secret chamber, and Nicholas, having coughed slightly to announce his presence, and received an answer in a low, melancholy female voice, stepping through the aperture, and standing within a small closet. It was tenanted by a lady, whose features and figure bore the strongest marks of affliction. Her person was so attenuated that she looked little more than a skeleton. Her fingers were long and thin, her cheeks hollow and deathly pale, her eyes lustreless and deep sunken in their sockets, and her hair was jetty as a raven's wing, prematurely blanched. Such was the profound gloom stamped upon her countenance, that it was impossible to look upon her without compassion, while in spite of her war-gone looks, there was a noble character about her that elevated the feeling into deep interest, blended with respect. She was kneeling beside a small desk with an open Bible laid upon it, which she was intently studying when the squire appeared. Here is a terrible text for you, Nicholas, she said, regarding him mournfully. Listen to it, and judge of its effect on me. Thus it is written in Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone that make a son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that use of divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. A witch, Nicholas, do you mark the word, and yet more particular is the next verse, wherein it is said, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, and then cometh the denunciation of divine anger against such offenders in these awful words. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God will drive them out from before thee. Again it is said in Leviticus that the Lord setteth his face against such to them are, and in Exodus the law is expressly laid down thus, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. There is no escape for her, you see. By the divine command she must perish. Human justice must carry out the decree. Nicholas, I am one of the offenders thus denounced, thus condemned. I have practiced witchcraft consulted with familiar spirits, and done other abominations in the sight of heaven. I ought to pay the full penalty of my offences. Do not, I beseech you, madam, replied the squire. Continue to take this view of your case. However, you have sinned, you have made amends by the depth and sincerity of your repentance. Your days and nights for you allow yourself only such rest as nature forces on you, and take even that more so willingly. Past in constant prayer, your abstinence is severer than any anchorus ever practiced, and I am sure in the last month you have not taken as much food altogether as I consume in a day, while not content with this, you form as penance that afflict me beyond measure to upon, and which I have striven in vain to indulge you to follow. There will be no occasion to deliver yourself to justice, madam, and if you go on thus and do not deal with yourself a little more mildly, your accounts with this world will be speedily settled, and I should rejoin to think so, Nicholas replies to study, if I had any hope in the world to come, but alas, I have not, I cannot by any act of penitence and contrition expiate my offences. My soul is darkened by despair, I know I ought to give myself up that heaven and man alike require my life, and I cannot reconcile myself to avoiding my just doom. It is the evil one who put these thoughts into your head, replied Nicholas, and who fills your heart with promptings of despair, and he may again obtain the mastery over it, but take a calmer and more consolatory view of your condition. Human justice may require a public sacrifice as an example, but heaven will be satisfied with contrition in secret.
I shall so violate it, vainly striving to draw over from his words. Oh, Nicholas, you do not know the temptations I am exposed to in this chamber, the difficulty I experience in keeping my thoughts fixed on one object, the distractions I undergo, the mental obscurations, the faintings of spirit, bodily frustration, terrors, the inconceivable terrors that assail me. Sometimes I wish my spirit would flee away, be at rest. Rest there is none for me, none in the grave, none beyond the grave, and therefore I am afraid of death, and still more of the judgment of death. Man might inflict all the tortures he devised upon this whole frame, I would bear them all patience to life. If I fall, they would purchase me immunity hereafter, but with the dreadful vision, the almost certainty that it will be otherwise, I can only look to final consummation with despair. Again, I tell you, these suggestions are evil. Said Nicholas, the son of God who sacrificed himself for man, by whose atonement all mankind bought for salvation, had assured us that the greatest sinner who repents shall be forgiven, and indeed is more acceptable in the eyes of heaven than him who has never erred. Far be it from me to attempt to exculpate you in your own eyes, or extenuate your former criminality. You have sinned deeply, so deeply that you may well shrink aghast from the contemplation of your past life, may well recoil in adorance from yourself, and may fitly devote yourself self in constant prayer and acts of penitence, but having cast off your iniquity and sincerely repented, I bid you place a confident reliance in the clemency of all merciful power. Give me much comfort, Nicholas, said the lady, and if tears of blood can wash away my sin, they shall be shed, but much as you know of my weakness, even you cannot conceive its extent in my madness, for it was nothing else. I cast off all hopes of heaven, renounced my demon, was baptized by a demon, and entered into a compact by which I should to speak it. My soul was surrendered to him. You place yourself in fear. Jeopardy, no doubt, rejoined Nicholas, for you have broken the contract in time, and all righteous judge will not permit the penalty of bond to be exacted. Seeing your penitence, Satan has relinquished all claim to your soul. I do not think it applied the lady. He will contest the point to the last, and it is only at the last that it will be decided. As she saw a sound like mocking the laughter reach the ears of Nicholas. Did you hear that? demanded Mistress Nutter, in accents of wildest terror. He is ever on the watch. I knew it, I knew it. Clasping her hands together and fixing her looks on Hi. She then addressed the most fervent supplication to heaven for deliverance from evil, and ere long her troubled countenance began to resume its former serenity, proving that the surest balm for a mind diseased is prayer. Her example had been followed by Nicholas, who, greatly alarmed, had dropped on his knees likewise, and now arose with somewhat more composure in his demeanour and aspect. I am sorry, I do not bring you good news, madam, he said, but Jem Device has been arrested this morning, and as the fellow is greatly exasperated against me, he threatens to betray your retreat to the officers, and though he is probably unacquainted with it, notwithstanding his boasting, still he may cause search to be made, and therefore I think you had better be removed to some other hiding place. Deliver me up without more ado, I pray you, Nicholas, said the lady. You know my resolution on that point, madam, he replied, and therefore it is idle to attempt to shake it. For your daughter's sake, if not for your own, I will save you in spite of yourself. You would not fix a brand forever on Alison's name. You would not destroy her. I would not apply the wretch lady. But have you heard from her? Have you seen her? Tell me, is she well and happy? She is well and would be happy. Were it not for her anxiety about you, replied Nicholas evasively. But for her sake, man and your own, I must urge you to seek some other place of refuge tonight. For if you are discovered here, you will bring ruin unto us all. I will no longer debate the point, replied Mistress Nutter. Where shall I go? There is one place of absolute security, but I do not like to mention it, replied Nicholas. Yet still, as it will only be necessary to remain for a day or two till the search is over. When you can return here, it cannot much matter. Where is it? asked Mistress Nutter. Malkin Tower, answered the squire, with some hesitation. I will never go to that cursed place, cried the lady. Send me hence when you will now or at midnight, and let me seek shelter on the bleak fells or on the desolate moors. Bid me not go there. And yet it is the best and safest place for you, returned Nicholas somewhat testily. And for that reason, that being reputed to be haunted, no one will venture to molest you. As to Mother Demdeek, I suppose you are not afraid of the ghost, and if the evil beings you apprehend were able or inclined to do you mischief, they would not wait till you got there to execute their purpose. True, said Mistress Nutter, I was wrong to hesitate, I will go. You will be as safe there as here, I and safer, rejoined Nicholas, or I would not urge a retreat upon you. I am about to ride over to Middleton this morning to see your daughter and Richard Ashton, and shall sleep at Wally, so that I shall not be able to accompany you to the tower tonight. But old Crouch, the huntsman, shall be in waiting for you as soon as it grows us. In the summer house, with which, as you know, the secret staircase connected with this room communicates, and he shall have a horse in readiness 
must take you together with such matters as you may require to the place of refuge. Heaven guard you, madam. Amen, responded the lady, and now farewell, said Nicholas. I shall hope to see you back again ere many days be gone, when your quietude will not again be disturbed. So saying, he set back, passing through the panel, closet after him.